I'm uh, Nico Strater from the Dalla Omar Institute at the, um, at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, we are presenting this webinar in col collaboration with SELGA and with the support of the Hunt Seidel Foundation. Now, not only uh, do we have to contend with, with the lockdown, and but fortunately, I think we've all learned that webinars, you can actually draw your audience from across the country, but we also have to contend with the electricity crisis. Um, at the moment, uh, Professor Jaap de Fisser, who is supposed to moderate uh, the session, is sitting in darkness, or no, with no electricity, in Pinelands, um, and my electricity is going to go off uh, at 12 o'clock. Um, so uh, I'll kick off, and uh, as soon as the electricity comes on in Pinelands, uh, which is probably in about 10 minutes, YARP will take over. Now, uh, just a couple of house rules. Um, you are all very familiar probably now with this mode of uh, communication. Um, uh, and, and just a couple of house rules that we need to, to keep to. One is keep your mute on uh, because uh, background noise uh, disrupts the, uh, the, the, your, your, the, the audibility of, of the speakers. Secondly, also keep the cameras off uh, because that uh, consumes a lot of uh, data and also puts pressure on, on the system. Um, we have a chat box and I already see there are 22 uh, messages on the chat box. So that's uh, 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 the way that posing uh, questions, comments, that's the way to go. And that the speakers, uh, we will all pick up on on that during discussion time. The meeting um, is recorded. So if anyone is a bit uncomfortable with that, uh, you know, you can leave uh, the room, the virtual room. Now, let us turn to our issue of today. Uh, it is local elections next year, uh, governance and stability. Now, as you can imagine, we are in unusual circumstances. Uh, elections needs to be prepared in the time of, of lockdown. Luckily, we are at level two. And also, luckily, um, the elections is only scheduled at least in the second half of, of next year, which by then we hope all has returned to normal. Local elections have also been in the news regarding uh, whether there should be a single election date for national, provincial and local, but I don't think that is going to be an issue for, for the coming election. But the focus um, of the discussion is really on governance and stability. The effect that an election has on uh, the administration. Um, what what is that effect? Um, is it necessary? Is it a in a sense a, a paralyzing or disruptive effect? And we will hear from people um, in the field uh, and knowledgeable on the question: um, How do we deal with um, the issues of the run-up to the election? Um, how municipalities are administered during that time? Now, we have a, a fantastic lineup of, of speakers that uh, will, uh, will address us. Um, the first to mention here is Mr. Sai Mamabolo, uh, the CEO of the IEC. Uh, it's fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Um, uh, there's a big task uh, lying on your shoulders to, to get the election done. I think in very difficult circumstances now, um, you have been at the IEC for some time. You're most probably most experienced election officer that we have um, running the national provincial elections uh, in uh, first in 
2016 and also now um, last year uh, at the national level. Um, then uh, we have Dr. Tina Nzo, who's a senior researcher at the Public Affairs Institute, PARI, um, who works in the area of bureaucracies in practice, politics, uh, in representative local democracy, and the dialectic between party and the state. How does it occur? How does it uh, field out that uh, uh, areas of speciality? And then uh, we have an old colleague, uh, Dr. Jan Mettler, who uh, is probably his most biggest claim to fame is that he worked at the uh, Dalla Omar Institute um, when it was still called the Community Law Center. And then he went on to do some other minor things like uh, working for Salga, becoming the municipal manager for uh, Nelson uh, Mandela Bay municipality and other municipalities. So extremely experienced in administration about what happens at a municipal level at the time of elections. Um, let us start in, in, the, in the order um, that is suggested that we start off with uh, Mr. Mamabolo, then go to Johan, and then uh, conclude with, with, with Tina. Is that to be in order? So the first person that we'd like to call on is uh, Sai Mamabolo. Are you hearing us? You unmuted and very welcome. And again, our real appreciation of making time on a Friday morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Prof. And um, may I extend greetings to my fellow panelists, uh, Johan and Tina, uh, and uh, greetings to all the participants are here. We have close to 100 people already on the individual room. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, the, the topic that uh, is before us is obviously an important one, uh, as it is broad. Um, I'm going to limit my input to what will be the critical su success factors uh, to ensure free and fair elections. And I'm sure uh, my fellow panelists will deal with the other aspects um, of the topic at hand. And perhaps the opposite point to start it's really what, what is an election um, and how is it related to, to governance? The, I think the success, success factors uh, of any election is a confluence of key elements. And those elements are an election as a legal process an election as a political process, an election as a, as a logistical undertaking, and lastly, an election as an administrative process. So what makes a successful uh, election is the confluence of those four key elements. These elements are in the interdependent in a symbiotic relationship. So there's a great uh, symbiosis of those uh, four key elements. Uh, they are distinct electoral matters, yet synergistic. So, so you can't have a successful election with a negation of any of those four elements. They are inter interdependent, but in a very symbiotic uh, relationship. Uh, they are distinct, but synergistic. They, they act in consort with one another to produce a particular electoral reality. Although these uh, elements and factors are distinct, they must coalesce over an extended period of time, culminating with a declaration of results. So they must coalesce, act together, 
uh, over an exp extended period of time, culminating uh, with a declaration of results. And my proposition is that these factors must coalesce at least in the period governed by the election timetable. That is the date from which an election is called right through to the date of um, the day of the election. So all these political factors, legal processes, logistical processes and administrative process from the date on which an election is called right through to election day, they are in a constant system of interaction right through to the point where an election uh, result is declared. So these factors, none of the factors must be negated at any point. For if one of those is negated, you are unlikely to realize a successful uh, election. There's a relationship of core importance uh, between uh, these elements. Now, let's start off with the, with the first element, an election as a legal process. It is necessary um, to have a legal process to create a certainty and predictability of the applicable rules. Hence, the, the, the legal instruments have to be generally accessible to all members of the public, and they must be accessible, the information thereon must be accessible in simplified ways or in simpli simplified formats. In our case, the relevant uh, legislative uh, framework includes the Electoral Commission Act, the Municipal Electoral Act, the Municipal Structures Act, re regulations on the registration of political parties, regulation on the registration of voters, um, and so on and so on and so on. All those form the base upon the legal base upon which an election stands. So the election is predicated on this combined legal framework. Now, obviously, in between elections, it's important that there's legal refinement. And for that purpose, ahead of 2021, we have proposed a number of legislative amendments, which cabinet has recently passed. And some of the key aspects of those amendments include having a varied voting procedure for those voters who don't have addresses still on the voters' roll. Those people, because they are citizens and they are accorded their uh, uh, constitutional rights, still have a right to vote. But we are introducing a valid voting procedure for them to be able to submit an address on the day of voting and for a determination to be made whether that address is within the ward uh, or not. It is important that we, <laughs> an address is not the basis upon which a person loses their franchise, that the address is used to ensure that they are voting uh, uh, correctly. Secondly, uh, looking at allowing um, access to the voters' role and the requirements of the Poppy Act. As best then any member of the public can ask for a voters' role and, and on payment of fee, and notionally, they can get a copy of the voters' role with very sensitive private information of voters, 26 million of them. So we are balancing the right to, uh, of all citizens to free and free election, uh, a right to access to the voters' role against the unnecessary disclosure of personal information as regulated by POPIA. 
And then we are also providing uh, for the registration of political parties um, at the district as well as at the provincial level. Hitherto, you could only register a party at the national level or at the local level. If you were a, a purely um, provincially based party, you'd need a national registration, even when you don't intend to contest uh, elections in other provinces. Now, the legal framework is important because, as I said, to create certainty about the applicable rules and so on. But correlated to that is the need for that information to be easily accessible to everybody. And for that purpose, ahead of elections next year, we are simplifying our website, making it more friendlier, um, more uh, form friendly so that whatever device you use, then it's easy to, to access and so on. Uh, and this is necessary uh, uh, because we want to facilitate people's access to all this um, information as well as providing fact sheets uh, because people have an aversion uh, to the reading of law. So simplified fact sheets about the registration of voters, about candidate nomination, uh, about the electoral code of conduct, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but another critical su success factor related to uh, the legal framework is having a vibrant system of electoral justice. By that I mean having credible, credible fora and processes for the resolution of electoral disputes. Because in an election um, which are concerned with the contest for state power, there's going to be disputes. There is no doubt. There's never an election without dispute. Otherwise, it will be, a, a, it will be outside of the reality of human existence. Any election is bound to have disputes. Now, uh, your electoral system has to provide for credible fora and processes um, uh, for the resolution of those disputes. Now, those processes and fora may, 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 may be formal or informal or, or both. In our case, they're both. We have um, the conflict management program, where at the provincial level, we have panel of conflict mediators who engage with uh, parties which are in dispute, communities that are in dispute and so on, to try to facilitate uh, the electoral process. But I must also acknowledge that increasingly, we find that the contestants don't want to subject themselves to the um, to conciliation processes. The stakes are becoming so high that people do not want to subject themselves to these informal um, mechanisms. At the formal level, um, obviously we have the um, electoral code of conduct which prescribed certain behavior. Uh, from the date on which an election is called right through to the declaration of results. And the electoral code of conduct is really, the, its purpose is to create a climate in which uh, an election can happen, uh, a, a climate of tolerance and so on and so on and so on. Now, the chief electoral officer in law can refer to the electoral code instances of violation of, um, of, of, of provisions of the electoral code of conduct. A, a very important issue here. It's a, it is not authorized to stand in judgment and evaluate um, extent of uh, the transgression and whether what sanction those transgressions must 
um, must must invite. And often there's a con there's a public confusion. People believe that the IC should sit, evaluate, and dispense sanction. It can't, because then we become a, 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 we we get into the electoral contest, whereas we should stay out of it. What we uh, the chief electoral officer can do is to refer uh, proven um, proven transgressions to the electoral court for adjudication and possible meeting of sanctions. Uh, and then of course, certain behavior um, or rather certain conduct um, which violates the electoral uh, code of conduct might invite criminal, uh, criminal sanctions. Now, that is, it, that is the, the aspects that regulate the, an election as an electoral, the election as a legal process. If you look at an election as a political process, perhaps the entry point there should be uh, this, uh, uh, this statement that local elections are about political contest for the control of state affairs within the local sphere. This is a quest for the legitimate assumption of state authority. And this comes with great control of assets and resources of the state. Hence, the human proclivity to power has increased. I mean, you know, those, the control of assets and resources um, uh, increases uh, with, um, with human uh, lust for, for authority, for power, and so on. Hence, the increasing contestation that we see, especially within the local sphere. So there's generally uh, a, human, a human tendency for power human tendency for control, and, and so on. And that manifests itself in the following way within the electoral sphere. The number of political parties. That's one way in which you see uh, the manifestation. Firstly, look, look at the number of political parties. As at today, this morning, we have 637 registered political parties in South Africa. Uh, 324 of them are nationally registered, and 313 are registered at a municipal level. All this with a singular intention, the acquisition of state authority to be able to control assets and resources of state. I must just add, uh, you'll see in the next few days that 102 of this number is going to be deregistered because there are certain annual procedures that you've got to follow uh, if you don't hold a seat in any legislature. You need to notify the Electoral Commission of your continued existence. So we've been interacting with them. We can't find these parties and so on. So they are due for, for deregistration, but even then, that would leave us with 535 um, registered political parties. Now, number of candidates. Number of candidates, again, this tells you about this uh, quest, this human tendency for access to authority. Um, in 2000, when we first launched the, uh, the new phase of local government, um, there were, there were 30,000 candidates in 2000 in that election. In the year 2006, that number increased to 45,000, a 50% increase. In 2011, that number increased to 53,000 a 19% increase. In 2016, the number of candidates increased to 63,000, another 19% uh, increase. So what does it mean for next year's election? 
I think we're looking at an increase in the number of candidates to the order of about 20%, if the trend, uh, the trend uh, co co continues. Um, so if we're looking at a 20% increase in the number of candidates, we're looking at 76,000 76, potential candidates uh, in next, next year's election. Uh, uh, of which 855 uh, are independent candidates, because that's another dimension uh, to the electoral contest. Uh, so for next day's election, therefore, we are also looking at a, a, a 1,026, thereabout, approximately, uh, independent candidates uh, as part of that 76,000. So that tells you about the, uh, the contest uh, and the depth and, and the broadness of the contest within the local sphere. Now, the third, the third component, um, which is my penultimate point, is an election as a, as a, as a logistical undertaking. Um, any, you know, if you, you go to, I've seen Mr. Samson is here, will tell you that an election stands or collapses on the quality of its lo lo logistics. Um, but I just want to give you a, a simple uh, complexity around logistics, just the ballot paper, on the ballot paper, one element, the, 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 the ballot paper. You see, in a, in a national and provincial election, we, we, we're preparing 10 different ballots, one national type ballot and nine different uh, provincial ballots. In local government, we're preparing um, 44 uh, different district ballots, uh, 213 uh, different met, uh, PR ballots, and 4,392 thereabout, give and take, uh, what ballots. Now, and we have to print all these combinations in correct quantities per, per ward, uh, cumulatively 74 million uh, ballots that have to be printed within um, a 10 day window period. So the moment you finalize your candidate nomination uh, to the day on which they must be at the voting station, you have 10 days. So within 10 days, you've got to print 74 million uh, ballots in 4,500 uh, different permutations. So there's great um, ballot production complexity, um, which, is, uh, which is very important because a ballot paper is so basic to an election that you cannot get it wrong. Um, is the basis, uh, it's a critical success factor to a successful uh, election. And to print the 74 million ballots, you need 500 tons of um, 500 tons of of paper. Last issue, uh, uh, which is a critical success factor in a in an election, is the issue of an election as an administrative process and the quest for electoral ex administrative excellence. And here I'm going to take, uh, to, to, to exemplify this by two points. One, the, the, the voters role. You know that in 2016, we had a huge brouhaha um, related to addresses on the voters role. We had 8.6 million complete addresses on the voters role in 2016. We went to the Concord, I don't want to go into the precise details of the case. Um, and that, I think, spoke to our administrative robustness around uh, the maintenance of the voters' role. 
but it's an issue that was born out of um, legal clarity because uh, until that point, the Electoral Commission never understood that an address had to be kept on the voters' roll. That was never its intention. Uh, but the court interpreted the statute in a manner they did and our administrative uh, robustness vis-a-vis -vis an address was found, was found wanting. So we had 8.6 million um, uh, complete addresses on the voters' roll against 25 million people who were registered. We've worked at that situation. Uh, and today, as we speak, uh, the complete addresses on the voters' roll is 24.6 million out of um, 26.4 million. So about 94% of all voters on the voters' roll today have a complete address. Um, obviously, that's one element. Those addresses still have got to be within the world boundary. And that it's a, it's a process we're still working on, but we're working with uh, political parties so that if they have objections, they, uh, they may, they may uh, object. My last point, Chair, is that the one critical success factor is the ability of the Electoral Commission to count ballots, capture those uh, results on a result slip correctly, and then transmit them to be captured in the same way. Because the, the, that result slip becomes the bearer of the sovereign will of the people within a, a particular voting district. And our ability as an electoral commission to ensure that we maintain integrity of the process from the point of counting, point of collation, and point of capturing and transmission is absolutely necessary. And I think we will not spare any effort uh, with respect uh, to that. Now, in conclusion, all these four elements can be negated. They must coexist. They must all coalesce over an extended period of time until the date on which the election results are declared. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mama Bolo. Um, yeah, I'm just breathless to think about this mammoth task of uh, how many candidates, how many ballots, uh, and what we have a sense is the integrity and success of our past elections, uh, amazing feat that has been carried off every time. So thank you very much for a, a very enlightening exposition of the various aspects of uh, elections and the management to deal with it both on legally, politically, and administratively, uh, it, it's massive. Thank you very much to set that scene for, for our discussion. Now, um, I can now safely hand over to uh, enlightened uh, director of the Dalla Omar Institute, Yap de Fisser, who is back with us. Yap, over to you. Thank you very much, Nico. Um, thanks for uh, standing in uh, and for a wonderful introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Apologies that I wasn't here to welcome you, um, but I think the reason was explained, uh, and we're all contending with, um, with those challenges as we speak. I have been able to follow everything thus far, um, so I'm really pleased with, um, with this morning's proceedings. The turnout so far is fantastic to have all of you here. Um, and let me not waste any further time. Uh, thanks, Sai, for that wonderful introduction and really make us appreciate the enormity of, of the challenge of organizing a legitimate election. And I'm sure we'll pick up on some of the points that, that you've raised. But let's go straight to the next input. Uh, Johan Mettler, a local government expert and former city manager of Nelson Mandela Bay. Um, you've already been introduced earlier, so I'm going to hand over straight straight to you. Over to you, Jan. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jaap, uh, and also good morning to uh, everybody on, on, on the platform, as well as to my two uh, 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 partners in crime, uh, Tina and uh, Sai. Um, uh, just, uh, uh, just for starters, um, 
I I want to I want to share with with Sai that I am an absolute op opponent uh, to uh, a, a single election for all three spheres on one day. Uh, I have a democratic argument, but what you have set out in terms of the logistics just adds to what I think would be an impossible nightmare and something that will have a, a, a dire effect on our democratic system should that ever come to pass. That is my view. Uh, right or wrongly, we can share a glass of wine if, uh, if you think you can convince me otherwise. Um, um, I, it's a great honor for me to, to be here. Um, I recall that, uh, that, that in the beginning of 2000, uh, Nikus Stadler shipped me off to, uh, to, to Pretoria to assist, to, to spearhead a task team to, uh, to ensure that the first local government elections take, take place uh, so that we had all municipalities established uh, by the 5th of September so that the elections could take place three months later. So I'm happy to, to still be around uh, YAP uh, and also via the Dalla Omar Institute. Um, I'm going to look at three um, aspects of the, of, uh, as, as far as the, uh, the political, sorry, the, 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 the governance and administration is, is constant during an, an electoral period. That is the uh, political atmosphere with, within a, a, a municipality. I'll look at political contestation, and I'm also going to look at professionalism. So as far as the political atmosphere is concerned, um, we all know that on any given day in a municipality, there is the, the political atmosphere is at least tense. Uh, and that can be for simple reasons, such as service delivery not happening or, or other pressures um, uh, there could also be governance issues in the municipality, uh, the, the coalitions, and I think what we have, what we are seeing in the metros, in, in most of the metros, at, at, at least, is, is a sign that they, they are, or in some of them, the metros, maybe not most. So, so, so that political atmosphere um, is an uh, is an area then within which the your senior managers, your municipal manager, must manage political expectations and this is a, a this is a, a a task that is not understood i i think by uh, by many people because the management of political expectations um, really can make or break uh, an institution um, so within a within a normal uh, within the normal year let's say the first four four years the expectations really is around uh, service delivery performance management uh, audit results and so on and um, if you are a, a, a municipal manager that knows his or her story then then you would try and manage the expectations as as far as you can so that at least there can be some uh, 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 progress so that people feel politicians feel that we are at the, that we are achieving something so they can go and report back on success stories uh, you, you would then also know that that very last financial year of the cycle the very last one that is not the year that you're going to promise we're going to do more things you should really be then in a in a period of consolidation in that last one and because that last financial year is where your politicians are going out to uh, prepare for the elections they are going to go out and tell the the uh, the their communities what they have done in the previous three financial years and so what i told my councillors both in drakenstein and in the uh, and nelson mandela bay Please don't expect miracles in that very last one. In that very last financial year to the elections, um, that is when things will 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 uh, will uh, run smoothly within the municipality because we would have already achieved by the third one, by the third uh, uh, financial cycle, what you needed to achieve because no politician can afford to go to his or her community 
and, 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 and say, please vote for me, I will still do the following. That doesn't work. They, they, they will come to you and say, we need to say what we have done. So, and that is one way then to manage the political expectations so that you are not expected to perform the proverbial miracle during the period now until the election. That because that is well nigh impossible. But, but, but in a way, that is part of what happens. But, but life being life and local government being what it is, that does not happen. So there's a great expectation on, 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 the, on uh, the administration to perform the proverbial miracles. If you have not gotten rid of, 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 uh, uh, of if you haven't sorted out your sanitation issues, you must do it now. If you haven't built the 2,000 houses that you said you're going to do, you shall do it now during this financial year. And, 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 and. It then becomes highly contested and, and, uh, and, and in fact, stressful for everybody con concerned and people tend to take the eyes off the ball. So that's the one aspect under the political atmosphere, which, uh, which if you then throw an election in, it becomes really, really, very, very difficult. Not, not, not impossible, but it becomes difficult. But uh, contributing to this political atmosphere is, of course, the state stroke party distinction, the distinction between the party and the state. And I think that's something that Tina would, would probably look at later on. But this issue becomes much more pronounced in the lead up to an election where, um, the, where the incumbent party could easily, could, could easily fall into the trap of confusing um, uh, the, 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 the state platform, where, where it can say, this is what I have done, and confusing that with a party pl platform by still saying, this is what we have done, but we attend those, those meetings, if I can call it that, if I can make this example, in our party regalia. So, so, so we pitch up in our yellow t-shirts, our blue t-shirts, our red t-shirts, uh, our orange t-shirts. I, 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 could, I, I couldn't remember what, what are the other parties' colors, but anyway, those are the four ones. That, that come to mind. So, so, so the distinction between state and party becomes blurred during an electoral, uh, uh, just in the run up to, to elections. And it is really important for, 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 for all actors, whether you're in the administration or, or in the political sphere, to maintain that distinction because it will impact on the credibility or on the credibility, not only of the election, but also of the whole process. Because people will look at this and say, but you are using the municipality's resources to advance your own party. Um, I, I must add, I must add, colleagues, that, that if one has not maintained this distinction throughout, throughout the term, it will be an impossibility to maintain that distinction in the run-up to the elections. In fact, the die by then have been cast. It is over. You are now partisan as an administrator. You have no choice in the matter. Um, if you don't do it, you'll probably be taken out. Uh, um, uh, taken out, I mean, now being suspended and so on. Um, so, so, so that uh, the distinction between party and state, I think, is very important uh, in how we manage the political atmosphere during that period. Secondly, I want to speak to you uh, just on the political contestation within, uh, within that period. And, um, and I'm reminded, uh, I'm reminded of, of, of a saying that the politician, I said, I can't recall who it was. Um, I think it was maybe in the British Parliament where uh, somebody said, um, uh, uh, someone re re referred to a politician and said, so, so, so what do you think of your enemies over there on the other side? They said, no, 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 no. Those are my political opponents. 
my enemies are sitting next to me and behind me. And I want to tell you, in my experience, that if ever there was a tourism, it is that. I can tell you that. That as a political, as a, as a, as a, as a counselor, you've got your opponents and you've got your enemies. And uh, look at the color of your t-shirt and look at the color. If they are similar colors, uh, they, are, they, are, they are, when it comes to the elections, they are your enemies. And I'm saying this not, not, not because I want to uh, cast uh, any aspersions, no. I am, I am relating to you the political atmosphere, the political con contestation that also plays out at the local level as people, as councillors, or politicians compete for a place on the list. Because the higher up on the list you are, the more likely you are to then get a, a position. If you are number one on the list, you may be the mayor, or if you go through a particular process, because not all parties are the same, you go through a competitive process, and, and they are, uh, uh, you have to go through hoops and tests and so on. Um, even that does not absolutely qualify or, or, or determine who's going to be the winner on merit. There's always a political contestation, and there are and and there are various interests within the within the political parties, and and that is so. And you and, and as an administrator, one must be aware of that, and uh, and and it puts more pressure on an administrator to be a, a non-partisan, even there. So I'm not talking about non-partisan between parties. I'm talking about non-partisan even within a political party, uh, as not to be associated with one grouping, because even that is is a difficulty. I want to give you an example of of um, where where such a thing can have a direct impact on on the role of an of an accounting officer within an electoral context, and that is uh, the declaration of vacancies. We've had the, the experience in uh, Nelson Mandela Bay quite recently, where a member of, of COPE um, uh, 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 was subject to a, this letter um, that was sent to the, she was the subject of a letter that was sent to the uh, acting city manager that says that this person uh, is no longer a, 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 a member of the party and she must, she, and she must be replaced. Uh, and a day or two, and, and that letter went off to the IEC because the job of the city manager is to inform the IEC. I've got this letter that says that this person is no longer councillor, and uh, and the uh, and the, 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 the ACN did that. Just to two days later, withdraw that same letter to say no, that is no longer the case. So you find so you find that the, the acting city manager becomes an arbiter. He, because the one letter says so, and then there's some, something else that, that happens. Now, that is an internal party contestation that resulted in, uh, in, 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 uh, in a mechanism being activated that uh, the, the city manager or the manager is this period coming that there will be a heightened degree of political contestation um, uh, with, within parties uh, where, where that, those kind of sh shenanigans uh, may, may happen and, uh, and, and the municipal managers would be, would be called on to make a call one way or the other, do I inform or don't I inform? There's no such discretion in the law, uh, Yap, as you know, you must inform. You you don't have a discretion, but uh, but I think uh, what the IEC could possibly do is to say, uh, at the beginning of a term, for these kind of letters, you can only receive it from this official in uh, these parties, and parties must say these are the officials that will send those because it will take out that kind of contestation and uh, for which the the the, the, the MM is then called upon. To, to be the arbiter. No MM wants to be the arbiter in an intra-party dispute. You, uh, you will get killed there. Uh, 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 look at my example. Look at me as an example. 
Um, the the last point that I that I wanted to raise, and I'm aware of the ten minutes up that you, that you at some stage you told me I had ten minutes, not today earlier. Uh, I want to talk about the professionalism, and you would have seen that uh, that I have in fact made mention of pro professionalism in the other two points of being non-partisan and, 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 and so on, and and being consistent from the word go in the distinction between state and party you know so it's not a new thing that i'm saying but i'm but but, but i want to emphasize the issue around professionalism the thing with profession with pro professionalism and uh is that it must be apparent and practiced from the out from the outset you can't suddenly become pro professional in the last five months or the, up, up to the elections that doesn't work it's like integrity you know, you have it or you don't have it. You don't suddenly discover integrity uh, just because somebody said that there shall be an, an election. By that time, everybody knows that uh, you and integrity uh, do not belong in the same room. So uh, so the issue around professionalism, professional for, for, for me is extremely important. It is something that must be consistent from, from, from the outset. But Clearly, it is not based on, on how somebody is. That's not my experience. Professional, pro professionalism is closely linked to, to one being firm, but based on legislation, based on, based on policy that was adopted within the municipality, based on established practice. Uh, 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 if, if, if they were, were them to look at the at the uh, at, at the election process that that there is a that there's a committee a provincial committee that sits and they talk about how things should play themselves out within the new rules for example Sai mentioned the the whole issue about uh, about uh, proof of address on the day so 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 clearly there should be a system that has been worked out that will make it very easy for a municipal electoral officer to say yes this works i i can confirm or no this does not work because it must be clear and your professionalism is then in applying those rules even if they are new rules based on the practice that you have adopted with the iec with the provincial electoral officer to say this is how we shall deal with it um, because the we all know what happens, or oh, maybe I should not say that we all know, but there is a common accusation, put it that way, during during an election period of busing. And that is where where one would bring people into a particular ward because the numbers don't look too good for you as a political party in that ward. So there is this practice of people coming in. Now clearly. Uh, um, in, in, in being professional, there must be a particular way how one would deal with that, as opposed to ad hoc. And that's the only point that I, that I, that I want to make, is that when, uh, when one would apply these rules, it would, be, it, it, it would cut either way. So it can't just affect one, one person or one party or one interest group. Um, because the, 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 the administrators of are professional, they have integrity. An electoral period or a period leading up to the election is brings a uh, brings a uh, uh, an, an added dimension of pressure, of contestation to the to the local government environment, to the to the municipality. It's an environment that needs to be managed. Um, it's a uh, it, it is an environment that needs to be managed uh, in a professional manner by by uh, individuals, by people, by by parties that have shown from the outset that they are that they are dealing with these matters even-handedly and with integrity. Uh, yep, thank you. That's all from me for now. Over to you. Thank, thanks so much, Johan. Uh, that, that was very interesting. Uh, a very 
um, lively view into what it means to work under that pressure uh, cooker of, of uh, local government and detention that plays itself out on a, on a daily basis uh, in, in local government and which obviously gets, um, you know, is, is heightened and increased in the run up to an election um, time. Um, the issue of, of consistency and professionalism to, to deal with issues such as these uh, you know, sort of intra-party conflicts, which I think are often underestimated when we talk about these issues, that actually the, the great tension often emerges uh, from uh, uh, conflicts and tension within, within political parties uh, in the run-up and, and to elections, particularly around party list um, uh, processes, etc. So I'm sure there's lots of themes that we can pick up on. Um, I want to go straight to to Dr. Tina Zo, but just to make the point that after Dr. Zo's input, we'll have ample time for for discussion and questions. So please keep the questions coming in the chat box. I'm trying to make notes of, of those questions as we go along, uh, and hopefully we'll get the panelists to engage with some of your questions afterwards. But let's go to Dr. Tina Zo. She, as was indicated by Professor Stapley, she works for the Public Affairs Research Institute uh, in the local government program there um, and uh, has done a PhD uh, that focuses on the issue of um, the interface between uh, the political and the administrative in local government. And I look very much look forward to her input. We're moving now from, you know, from the elections, the administration to the, you know, I think the political science, social science uh, perspective on the reality of, um, of this interface that uh, has to withstand all those tensions that Johan spoke about. So very much looking forward to your input, Tina. Thanks very much for joining us and uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Yep. I hope I am audible. Great. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me um, to participate in this dialogue and just to reflect a little bit about the local government elections and its, um, its relationship with governance and stability in municipalities. Well, um, what I'll do is that I'll just touch a little bit, um, you know, on the, the reflections or observations that we actually see, we did manage to see in the previous elections. Um, in the 20, 2016 local government elections, where those elections really introduced um, a shift into representative democracy, and particularly when you look at the council dynamics, where the ANC ruling party that really enjoyed dominant support experienced a decline, you know, a very significant decline compared to the 2011 local government elections, where it had 62% of the voter out um, voter support. And um, yeah, in, in 2016, basically they dropped to 54, 54%. And mainly the mainly contributing factors, you know, there are other um, things that we need to think of beyond the voter apathy and also the increase in support for opposition party in the electoral quant quantitative. The, the vectors of influence, um, or should I say the indicators that really contribute um, to the declining quality of democracy, because it's not only about the loss of support for the ruling party, but also about it, it talks to the quality of democracy where we are starting to see local government voter support dwindling at 50%. It talks around the issues of the declining quality of services. These are issues that have been, have been long coming for quite a long time. If we look at um, the 2009 report that was, that was um, delivered by the then late Minister Shibzega and his team from COCTA, when they actually conducted some research and also used other uh, forms of evidence-based um, research about the quality of local democracy and the functionality of municipalities. So we saw that issues around the declining of quality of services, where we find that communities have been really engaged in a numerous protest towards the elections, framing around the backdrop of poor service delivery. But of course, we cannot, um, you know, discount the fact that some of these um, these 
um, uh, protests are built around the contestation for political office, as like um, Sai had mentioned, that we, we start seeing uh, more candidates coming into, you know, to register for local government because they, it presents the opportunity of holding political office. So you find that even when it comes to the list process, as um, Johan also mentioned, that we see these contestations really coming to, to take place in the forefront and expressed through, through service delivery protests, framed around service delivery protests. In the city of Tswane, we saw that the mayoral candidate, um, um, Togo Disdiza, in 2016, um, where people really rejected her because they were they were bemoaning the fact that she was an imposed candidate, which had an impact on the voter outcome and in that municipality. So there are also issues around patronage that we need to we need to consider factional politics, which we need to consider for the clamor for access of resources through political office. So also other things that we, we also need to, to really consider that along coming around issues along, around um, political, administrative, bureaucratic instability, where we know that municipalities have often really had a problem when it comes to the way in which um, elected and appointed um, 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 office bearers have often had tensions you know with senior managers in most municipalities and resulting in many um, senior managers being um, being being um, you know um, suspended from their from their portfolios due to certain allegations some some of these allegations are trumped up or Course, due to these tensions that they have with the with their political office bearers, so that contributes towards that in, in, you know instability, if I should put it that way, and looking at the governance instability and dysfunctionality in the way in which these governance structures also work in municipalities, particularly the executive committee and the mayoral committees that we have, where you also have tensions between speakers and mayors, and the caucus whip a caucus whip, which is not even um, provided you know, in the municipal legislation, but um, is, is, is there as the party, the party leader that leads the caucus and also other issues related to portfolio committees. So um, these issues really play into, you know, the whole conglomerate of understanding, you know, the stability or instability of governance of municipalities and how these factor into um, what we see as the declining quality of services, which result um, in the, the, you know, in the declining um, of, of voter support. But on the other hand, what we also need to think of, um, which relates particularly to, to the IEC, is the extent to which um, political killings have become characteristic of local government elections. This um, talks to, to issues around, um, you know, the, the legal aspect um, of, of, of elections as well, where you find that um, issues around safety and security um, become a problem, in particular in KwaZulu Natal, where we saw a lot of councillors, um, including um, senior municipal officials, being assassinated during the time of the elections. And now it's beginning to, to pick up again because recently we we had reports of, um, of a ward councillor in, in Etiagwini who was assassinated on the 23rd of June. So we are going to start seeing more of these cases starting to emerge as we're moving towards the elections. But on the other hand, what is also very interesting in the contributing factor of, of, of these issues is the party state relationship um, with the administration. And I actually like linking it you know, with the exponential um, issues around corru corruption and maladministration and deviations that happen in municipalities. Because if you isolate corruption, you, you don't really look at it within these party state relations, which have really become so characteristic characteristic from, from, local, from a local government perspective. So this is an issue that um, Johan spoke briefly about, where towards the elections, you start seeing the blurring of party state relations from below becoming more visible. And this is a state where I always try to define as where you find senior managers um, being managers during the day and politicians by night. So in, in, in this kind of um, scenario where you find these prominent relations coming into local government is that 
um, most of the time where you get um, senior managers who are appointed into senior positions in local government uh, by the ruling party, particularly in, in municipalities that are governed by the ruling party, they prominently use what they call the deployment policy um, of appointing their, their loyal cadres and, and party members into these strategic um, 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 positions in municipalities and they offer an opportunity where the party can actually gain access to resources because you've got to remember that when you go into election it involves a lot of campaigning so political parties are depending you know on donations for their campaigns but obviously these donations are not always enough so um, which other way is it really viable for the political party to raise resources it's to tap into the resources of the municipality through their deployed um cadres who are sitting in these strategic positions to make these resources available um, for these campaigns but one thing that is also interesting is that these resources are not only about contributing towards the campaigns of the anc but these resources are made available to contribute towards the factional um, um, contestations of party members who are seeking to attain higher office or to become mayors or to become speakers um, or to become um, members of the mayoral committee or heading certain portfolio committees. So the, 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 these resources are then used, they are channeled um, to these factions, these dominant uh, factions that are running for, for, um, for political um, office or trying to get, um, you know, the the, the, the dominant space into these portfolios. So then you find that these party state relations become very crucial in that sense where senior managers are, are then brought into party stru structures to make sure that they make these resources available. Um, and that really feeds into a whole lot of maladministration. It feeds into a whole lot of um, corruption activities that might potentially come out of, of these um, in, in instances. So here, um, the most critical positions which become um, quite prominent is the chief financial officer and the municipal manager. Um, that's when I always say that, you know, as much as we are seeing the Auditor General outcome um, on local government showing a whole lot of irregularities, but you also got, we also got to understand that in some municipalities, irregularities are not just um, linked to the appointment of incompetent and unqualified chief financial officers or the, the support staff in the budget and treasury or the municipal manager. But in some municipalities, they are competent, they are qualified. But because of these party state relations, most of these um, uh, senior managers, the MM and the CFO, they are quite complicit and quite compliant to these part particularistic interests of political office bearers. And therefore, you, 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 you cannot um, only expect um, competency to be the answer to all the problems that we, we see in municipalities. That's when you've got to think about these party state relations and, and the complicitness played by senior, senior, senior officials. So where you find that in institutions where patronage is usually the, you know, the foundation of mutually beneficiation uh, relationships um, where um, you know, politicians are seeking, you know, um, this kind of staying power um, in political office. Sometimes you also need to understand that even senior managers, because they are on contracts, they also need a form of protection as well from being removed um, from, the, uh, from their positions. Should um, a new faction or should a new political party take, um, take office after the elections. So these mutually beneficial relationships are quite prominent um, at local government um, level. And that's where you see issues around maladministration um, really cropping up quite, quite prominently. And in some cases, you do get um, where issues of lack of ethics and lack of, lack of professionalism, um, where senior managers are seeking, you know, to self-preserve themselves and acquire wealth accumulation, and then they start to become rogue, sorry, rogue um, um, administrators, where they start forming even relationships with business people um, who are who are part of um, the process of tendering. For, for, um, for supplying of goods or services in municipalities. So they even bypass party local structures um, and become complicit in that sense. 
And um, one other thing that I also wanted to, to highlight as well, um, when we have to come back a little bit on, come back to, to, to the issues of uh, political factions that Sai spoke about is, is the rise of independence. Um, you know, he spoke about um, um, actually seeing that there were three, 637 parties that were registered and 313 of them were registered for local government elections. And they were seeing an increase over time of candidates coming in. So um, one thing that I also managed to pick up in the previous elections is that if you look at um, you know, the independent candidates, say for instance, from, from the year um, 2000, um, you find that there were 689, but in the previous 2016 elections, these independent candidates um, rose up to 855 um, in 2016. So this provides an example of the significance of ward representative shifts, which are now becoming to, you know, to, to, to take shape in local government where um, candidates are looking at you know representation beyond the party political banner and trying to to move towards the trustee and the delegate uh, model of representation and um, another issue that really feeds into this um, connect in connection with um, the issues around factional politics is that we are starting to see ANC councillors um, you know voting against their own political parties um, in council. In fact, it's one of the, 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 the major issues that we are, we are starting to see emerge in most of these councils. And um, for a case um, in point, at Maludi Apofong, where you found that um, 15 ANC councillors who voted against an alleged corrupt mayor were suspended from the political party. And then they decided to stand for, for elections on in a by-election in 2018 uh, uh, as independents. And um, nine of these uh, 15 councillors actually got, got to, to resume their awards as, as representatives standing um, as independent candidates. So it comes to show that there are major shifts that are starting to, to happen at local government level. But what does this really tell us about the, the, the party governance as I move towards um, the end of, of my discussion? Well, here is that firstly, though we do understand that um, in local government, um, there is what we call political party group caucuses, you know, which can be defined as these coherent and and um, and loyal, you know, disciplined body of councillors, you know, that have to vote and take decisions um, as a collective. At the same time, um, you know, this characteristic is beginning to diminish. At first, it was really proverbial to to stand for political for political office under the political party banner because. There's a provision of party you know, campaigning, there are patron-client relations between councillors and their communities and their branch supports, support, uh, support that they're enjoying. But um, um, as time goes on, as we are seeing when it comes to the governance structures in municipalities, we are finding that there is a, there is a growth in internal resistance uh, where councillors want to actually enact on their trustee and delegate model of representation outside of the political party, um, where um, councillors are really beginning, you know, to, to take decisions in removing um, alleged um, executive or mayoral committee members, particularly mayors, um, who, who are involved in corruption. And we have seen that quite prominently at Tlokwe Municipality, Salt Lake Municipality, Maludia Pofong is another case, and in Mangawung as well, um, just recently now in, in August where the mayor was removed by, by ANC councillors. So that on its own builds into the understanding of the, you know, the governance instability that we are starting to see in municipalities, particularly where mayors are not able to even finish their term of office and not to talk about um, you know, the, the coalition government, uh, city governments in the city of Johannesburg and Swane, where these you know, um, hung councils um, continue to renegotiate their political position in order to hold on um, to power when it comes to um, these significant uh, political office bearer um, um, positions. 
But again, these, this instability of governance is also linked, again, to issues of corruption, you know, with the case of um, Zandile Komede being removed as the mayor of, of, of Itigwini municipality, allegedly, you know, being involved um, in, in, in corruption activities really tells us a lot about the way in which, um, you know, the governance structures and political representatives are able to enact their functions and responsibility, you know, within um, a very transparent manner. But of course, um, you know, it also takes us to another long-standing debate that we need to start reflecting on. Um, if we want to provide a sense of stability in municipal structures, and um, political representatives are at the forefront of um, providing that stability through their governance roles, then we have to start questioning, around, questioning the issues around, um, you know, the political management abilities of politicians who are elected as political office bearers, as mayors or speakers or even chairpersons of portfolio committees. You know, what kind of criteria and skills or set of experiences um, do political office bearer, bearers need um, to, to hold these portfolio committees? Are we going to continue moving towards the direction of factionalized appointments um, where um, certain individuals are, you know, are placed in these positions without the necessary, you know, skills and competence? Um, the, the whole issue around changing of mayors, which really um, contributes towards the, the institutional memory as well. You know, there, there was a debate around this in 2016, but that debate, you know, sort of like dissipated. And I think it's one of the debates that we need to continue having because they contribute, because if you're going to put um, weak political leaders into this, these positions, it contributes towards um, the further deteriorating um, functionality of these governance structures, um, oversight, particularly in oversight in the way in which um, municipal resources are managed and used. And then um, lastly, what is most important is that um, we also need to start thinking about the way in which we use um, financial indicators um, in providing, you know, an understanding of, of governance in municipalities. We, we do embrace the fact that, you know, the Auditor General is there to serve a purpose, a purpose to actually provide, you know, us with an insight into, into the financial um, health or financial management of institutions and the way in which resources are distributed. And we can see that with the Auditor General report that has been recently published um, for the period of 2018-19, these results are very, very damning very damning. It's, 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 it's really um, heart-throbbing to see that local government is actually not in a state of, of improvement. But at the same time, you know, are these reports adequate enough for us to, to start, um, you know, engaging in matters that are related to the quality of services that we find in municipalities, um, as particularly where issues of social audits are not even part and parcel of our assessments of um, of the the health of our of our municipalities when it comes to issues of service delivery, and then lastly, um, most importantly, is is the issue of national politics and how also national politics also shape the local government voter support and outcome. We know that in the previous um, elections in 2016, um, the governing party underestimated the impact of the national societal concerns around issues of corruption that were, that were um, related to, to the Jacob Zuma administration. And now we found ourselves in the same position again, um, where currently the Ramaphosa administration is also um, under serious, enormous pressure um, particularly when it comes to issues around the COVID-19 scandals, which have further, you know, placed the ruling party under, you know, a macroscope, revealing some of these very strikingly lethargic and incompetent and dire lack of bureaucratic capacity in managing the state and its resources, which will likely influence or shape the voter attitudes when it comes to the 2021 local government elections. I mean, allegations of food parcels, distribution of, uh, of food, food parcels to party members and family and friends, um, the non-delivery of, of water, 
uh, tanks at OR Tambo district municipality. I've been following um, the, the, the portfolio committee in parliament that is, is dealing with that issue. You know, it, it, it has really revealed, you know, the dire, dire um, concerning um, state of our affairs when it comes to local government. And um, if, you know, we don't really take these issues seriously, then they will contribute um, towards um, the, the decline in the quality of our local democracy. So um, in an absence of, of a reform agenda, which is quite concerning to me because in the previous um, um, road towards the elections, you know, there was this reform agenda that was being shaped by the previous Minister of Cooperative Governance um, around issues of back, back to basics. But during this time, you know, um, despite the fact that we are dealing with COVID-19, um, the Minister of Co Cooperative Governance is very silent. Um, I, I was looking for a statement where she would make on the audit outcomes and what's the plan to, you know, to shift or change things around, what kind of reform agenda we need. You know, it's, it's, the, the silence is quite deafening. So it's very concerning to me that we are just a few months away um, from local government elections and we still don't have a very conclusive agenda in terms of how are we going to remedy the declining um, state of governance in our municipalities. So um, in conclusion, yep, um, I think I've spoken a little bit beyond my time. Um, as um, as um, Johan said that, you know, taking up on cosmetic, you know, fixing of services in, for, for the preparation of local government is not adequate. We need to start um, re-engaging, you know, in a very, very Im important discussion that has been put at abeyance um, because of the Municipal Systems Amendment um, Act that was declared unconstitutional because of um, the procedural problems that came with um, that act, where professionalization of local government needs to come back to the forefront, onto the table, where issues around competency of senior managers, ethics around the conduct of senior managers, um, even the competency of political office bearers need to also come to the forefront and we need to have these conversations because that's the only way that we, we will start really dealing with issues around um, local government and the, and the complexities around the bureaucratic management of the local state. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, that was a very rich, comprehensive input. Uh, much appreciated. Very many um, very important points brought across. I'm particularly struck by the point that you made around the shifts, um, seeing in the emergence of more independence, uh, local parties, you know, picking up on the statistics that um, that Sai shared with us. Of course, independents were always able to participate in, in local elections. Uh, local parties uh, have always also been able to to register locally for the elections um, but the trend that you pointed out uh, I think on the back of, of, of science statistics is the you know the changing dynamics of local politics and also uh, more in sort of independent minded uh, councillors who are voting against uh, their own political party um, you know I sort of uh, sort of the uh, the Robin Hood instinctive response is that's fantastic, but uh, because we need independent minded counselors, but you know, there would also be voices to say, well, this is also not good for stability because it makes politics very unpredictable. Uh, so lots of uh, interesting arguments raised um, by you, the impact of national politics on what we're seeing playing out at, at local government level. And as your uh, very realistic view I think on the reality of uh, of the uh, the patronage systems that um, that often um, rule how how these things play play out at, at local level. Uh, so thanks very much. I think three very rich inputs. We have about half an hour left to to discuss these in a bit more uh, detail with with our uh, uh, the rest of the audience. Uh, I already have a lot of questions that have come through through the, the chat and there was also a few questions that were emailed to us beforehand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first um, sort of summarize and, 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 and throw those questions uh, out uh, before I ask uh, the audience to make further verbal input if they want to, because uh, in, uh, in the chat box and on the email, quite a few things have, have come through. So let me, let me go through some of the issues that have, that have come through. 
a few questions were raised, you know, in relation to the legitimacy of, of the process um, uh, of, of, of elections, and maybe Sai could, could comment a little bit more on how ballot papers are produced um, and, and, you know, what are the checks and balances put in place to make sure that at a local level, um, uh, in, in the voting stations, around the voting stations, uh, processes are, are, are done uh, fairly and, and according to, to the rules. Um, also, maybe for Sai, if, if he doesn't mind, a bit of a comment on the impact of COVID-19 on, on, on the elections. Quite a few questions coming through on that via the email and also in the chat box. At some point, there was even talk about postponing the elections. What if COVID-19 rears its head again? Uh, what, you know, what, what, are, what is the thinking? What are the, the, the level of preparedness uh, that, that we have uh, to deal with a possible re-emergence of COVID-19 or a, or a uh, an impact that or that may have on the elections. Um, again, just to stay with 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 the IEC, but maybe also Tina could respond to this because she she raised it also in her input. The issue of financial assistance to political parties. Um, there were some sort of comments in the chat box about how that is calculated, whether newly registered parties would qualify for financial assistance. I know this is not necessarily the IEC's mandate, but maybe it can comment on, 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 on what it sees in practice around that. And maybe Tina could also comment on, on that issue of how we uh, as uh, support uh, political parties participating, campaigning in elections and how um, the, the system for financial assistance there plays itself out uh, in, in practice. Question that was also put is whether we need a right to recall. Uh, and this has been on sort of the, the agenda for some time. Uh, I know this is not an issue related to next year's elections, but what would be the impact and the feasibility of having a system that councillors can be recalled um, by, by communities? I, I have my own views on it, but I would be interested to hear what, what the panelists say of it. Maybe Johan could, you know, comment, comment on that. Would that be a good idea? And, and Tina, also feel free to, to weigh in. Um, the qualifications for councillors and for or, or qualifications for candidates and for office bearers. I think Tina made a very useful distinction between the two. Um, and some questions came through on you know how do we how do we see that uh, the role of political parties in ensuring that councillor that that they field quality candidates and beyond that that they elect or have elected quality office bearers. Um, what is the experience there and, and, and what, do we, what do we make of, of the trends? Um, maybe Johan and Tina could, could respond to that. And then we have a question coming through on the role of community radio stations in, in electoral uh, or voter education. Um, maybe more use of, of that was, was suggested. Um, maybe maybe um, Sai could, could respond to that from, from the point of view of, of the IEC. And then lastly, a uh, few points made on the single election. Again, not an issue for next year, uh, but it has come up. I'm also with, with Johan, a fierce critic of the single election. I think it's, it's a very bad idea. Uh, the democratic argument for me would be that a single election would completely crowd out any, any local accountability um, because the election would be completely dominated by debates and discourse around um, the national uh, debates and who's going to be the next president and, and which party is going to rule in the National Assembly. Uh, and I would fear the worst for the little bit of local accountability that we have built up um, over the last uh, a decade and a half in, 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 in local government. So I think it would be a very bad idea to go for a single election cycle regardless of the, the, the infra infrastructure requirements, logistical requirements, uh, six ballot papers, uh, which I think in the end is going to, is going to damage the credibility of the elections. Uh, so I, I'm very um, opposed to the single election cycle, but, but we, we, uh, we can hear more views on it. Um, so can I just maybe ask, um, Sai Mamabolo to maybe, if you can, briefly respond to some of these questions that have come through on the chat and, and hopefully pick up on the ones that I pointed out uh, for you. Um, maybe Sai, if you can come back in and uh, make your input. 
No, th thanks, uh, uh, th thanks very much. Um, on the issue of ballot, ballot production um, and the treatment of uh, the ballot paper throughout the, uh, the value chain, Obviously, a, a ballot is a very sensitive uh, commodity in the electoral process. So it has to be treated with a modicum of uh, caution and so on. Which is why we, um, we partner with uh, PIFSA, the Printing um, Federation of South Africa, uh, for purposes of them doing quality assurance for us because we print, we print at um, different um, printing works throughout the country. And we, are not, we don't have the capacity to be there 24, 24 hours. Hence, we, 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 we're working with industry, with the industry body uh, to ensure um, quality, ensure security, and so on. And when we distribute the ballot, obviously there are certain security measures that are, that are implemented. But embedded in the ballot itself, there are close to nine security features that each ballot paper has. Now, once the ballot is at the voting station, um, there's a ballot paper statement uh, that the presiding officer has to do at the end of um, voting, and that is, how many ballots were received at the station, how many were used, how many um, were canceled, and what the balance is. So the, the ballot paper statement uh, is an important control measure at the voting station and uh, um, party agents have a right to see what the statement is um, and whether it, um, it adds up uh, and, and, and so on. The second issue uh, on the impact of COVID-19 uh, on elections, certainly uh, the obvious impact is that we've not been able to, hold, to have by-elections uh, since March. We've postponed close to 86 by-elections, uh, which are due. Some of them um, a bit problematic because uh, they hold the balance of power within the municipal council. And the commission is eager uh, that we, as soon as possible, we clear those um, by-elections. We have um, drafted uh, a, the, a document on how to manage the voting station in a COVID um, um, a climate. How queuing is one obvious thing. The, uh, how we queue, adhering to social distancing, the use of sanitizers uh, to clean the surfaces, uh, each time uh, a voter leaves the station and so on. So all those things have been, uh, have been factored. The, the bigger question is on the, on the environment and the ability of political parties to, uh, to campaign. Um, uh, and so on. We are in discussions with COGTA uh, so that some adjustments could be made to the regulations to allow political parties to, uh, uh, to have access to, uh, to voters um, and, uh, and so on. But what the, um, the, the impact, the greater impact is going to be financial because we now need to provide PPE uh, for, uh, for our officials at the voting station. We've got to um, get sanitizer to ensure that every voter uh, can sanitize when they enter and when they leave the, uh, the voting stations. So um, we should therefore be in a position to announce um, soon when uh, these by-elections are going uh, to, be, uh, to be conducted. On the third question, financial assistance. I think this is a very crucial point um, because if the state does not sufficiently fund political processes in the country, um, 
political contestants are going to find alternative ways of getting money, including money um, that may have been acquired through means that are not transparent. And in there lies the possibility that our politics uh, might be at the whim of foreign influence. So it is, it, it is important therefore that uh, even with a very perilous uh, economic uh, climate, that a commitment is made to sufficiently fund um, all the contestants equitably and ensure that uh, we minimize the influence of foreign um, uh, foreign um, influences in our in our politics. There is a new party funding act, which has been assented to by the president, but yet to be uh, promulgated. Um, as the IC, we've prepared ourselves. The administrative arrangements have been made to ensure that uh, those who have to disclose can do that on online. And, uh, and so on. So all that work has been done and we are ready with respect uh, uh, to that. It is uh, very noteworthy that section 236 of the constitution acknowledges that um, the fiscals must fund political parties but limits that to parties who have representation in the national assembly and in provincial uh, legislatures. I, I don't know why that was not extended to local government. Um, and the, even the present act uh, that the president accented, accented to in terms of the multi-party democracy fund, it limits uh, uh, beneficiaries to parties with representation in the National Assembly and provincial legislatures and not local government. And I think as a country, there's a, a policy um, uh, lacuna that has got to be, uh, to be addressed going forward. Um, la uh, community radio stations, we've taken a, 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 a decision uh, as, uh, that we're going to be delivering uh, voter education um, via community radio stations, because you'll accept that uh, we can't go to communities and have community workshops to do voter education. Uh, voter education has to be delivered on broadcast media as well as social media. And one of the available uh, um, avenues for, for such delivery is community radio stations. So our colleagues in the provinces are coordinating with organized formations of community radios to contract and to all that is necessary. My last comment, uh, Jab, is on the, um, the single election. Um, I think it's a matter that um, must be considered carefully uh, by all South Africans, uh, and it requires a long uh, policy discussion, I believe, uh, which which might even have to include the views of the electorate. Uh, I therefore do not see the possibility of that uh, before next year's election. Thanks. Fine, some very wise words there. Um, let's go straight to Johan. Johan, feel free to comment on any of your other inputs and on your fellow panelists' input, but two issues maybe for you to just comment on. The right to recall, is that a good idea? Recalling councillors when they uh, don't perform uh, on behalf of communities and maybe the issue of qualifications for, for councillors and office bearers. But again, um, any comment that you want to add, uh, over to you. Okay, okay our, uh, colleagues. Um, with regard to the uh, uh, right to recall, my, my comment is uh, be careful what you wish for. Um, and, and I have two broad reasons why I am a bit hesitant. F firstly, um, an election is about winning and losing a seat. So you have basically two sets of losers, if I can call it that. Those that lose internal to the party, so I, so I didn't make it onto the list. 
So, so I'm not the ward candidate. So, so I lost out on that list, right? The, then, then you have the losers after the elections. So I was now elected, others have lost in the ward. And, and, and let me just speak about the ward councillor being recalled, but, but I think the same arguments would, would hold for the PR. Um, so, you, so you have in that small community of a ward or in a larger community of the municipality, those two sets of political interests that, 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 that would in any event, that, that in any event feel that they can do the job better. And, and I can tell you now, it is not an unheard of for people to, to campaign uh, internally that actually we can do a bit better job. That is not unheard of. And if I say not unheard of, it's tongue in cheek. I know it for a fact. But, but let us say it's not unheard of. Um, and that's over and above the, 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 the community uh, workers who also feel that they also have a constituency, just so by the way. And, uh, and actually, they should have been the actual uh, representatives. So, so, so you have lots of you have lots of contestation in any event, even before you bring the community in. There's there's already con contestation just on that pos on the p position, and there's a, and there's a contestation also within the context of poverty, uh, because there's resources allocated to that job, and that job also allows you access to to resources where there are ward budgets and so on. So, the, so, the, and that contestation will automatically, or the, the risk is, is that that contestation now gets heightened. There's a, there's a bite to it now. Because we can recall maybe once, maybe twice during an electoral cycle. And uh, so you can have, you, so you'll have that contestation throughout. And uh, uh, suddenly calling a, a ward meeting becomes a problem because it gets disrupted. Suddenly calling an IDP meeting in that ward becomes pro problematic because of the, the interest at play. And that we have seen. It is, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, it's not a parable that I'm talking about. It's real. These things happen. Meetings get disrupted. Uh, so, so that's the one thing. The second also, broad issue, broad reason, is, is that often there is a, 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 there's an exaggeration of the effect that a ward councillor has on development within his or her ward. The development in wards are subject to uh, the political, the, 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 the plan, the IDP, the, the service delivery budget implementation plan for the year, the IDP for the five years. So in a particular year, in year one or year two or year three, they may or may not be big infrastructure development in that in that particular ward or cluster of wards or sub council for that matter if you if you're in a metro city of Cape Town. But it's not your decision. It is subject to a decision, a bigger decision that says we will do that in year four, for example. Or there are so, we have so many competing we, we will not even deal with that ward or cluster of wards within this cycle. It's it is anticipated in the next uh, cycle. But it's, it, but it's on the broader plan, but it's not funded and, and so on. And there's very little that a ward councillor or a PR councillor can do about that kind of priority setting. That priority setting is dealt at a higher level. Uh, so, so really you can't hold that against uh, the, the councillor. So, so as far as I'm concerned, um, there may be reasons, maybe the, 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 the council does not call meetings and, 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 and so on, not available on the cell phone and, and all of that. And for that, there are, there are mechanisms within the council or even within the political party that can hold the council to account. But, but I do think that one must be careful what you, what, what you wish for. I'm aware that there is a drive for, for the right to recall. Uh, I do, however, for those two reasons, think it is uh, that we will open up a can of worms in Pandora's box, so, so to speak, and it's going to be very difficult to put the cap back on. Then with, with the qualification for, for, for office bearers, um, uh, not for councillors, but, but for office bearers. You know, um, I am the first person to say that, uh, that you don't want to be ruled by a bunch of lawyers and, and accountants and uh, engineers and teachers and, and priests. 
and we, and whoever else can 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 get the qualification. <laughs> um, uh, I don't think that we want that. Uh, so so so, uh, but at least you you would want people that can read and write, somebody that can actually engage with an agenda, that can engage with a policy. Uh, you know, as my teacher would say, you know, read with comprehension. <laughs> so. So, so I would not put that put that bar high, because it's democracy, you know. It's a, and we are still very early on in our democratic uh, experiment. Uh, so, so for us to 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 put a, a minimum there, I think one must be careful um, uh, that one doesn't overemphasize that point. Um, uh, so, so, but I, but I don't want to say much more about that. I've, I've said what I wanted to say about the single election. Um, uh, of course, Sai is uh, he, he, he cannot express himself in one way or the other because he's the CEO, and and, and that we must respect. Uh, so, so, uh, and, and he will be part of that kind of a process. But but those of us with strong views will also be part of that process of of of. Of, of uh, seeing to, to that. Just a, a small matter on the financial assistance to political parties, um, just a small anecdote. Um, uh, in, in, in 2000, um, I, I just went back to Salga uh, 2003, no, wherever it was, 2003, 2004. I argued for um, financial assistance to polit for political parties at local government level. I was hounded out of, uh, not out of the organization, but out of that particular meeting. People were very angry at me because at that stage there was one particular party that, that holds sway in the, in the local government sphere. Uh, I think Stephen de Vries may, may remember that period. And, um, uh, and then a few years later, literally uh, four, four years ago, somebody asked me, what happened to that document that you wrote about funding for political parties? So the wheel turn, um, but, I, but, I, but I do agree that, um, uh, you know, it needs to be the legislated that I do think that the state has a responsibility because you don't want political parties subject to other in influences, whether they be foreign or national, but they be influences that are not, uh, that are not welcome in a democracy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan. Um, let's turn to Tina. Um, the one issue that we haven't really spoken about, which came through in, in, the, in the questions and the comments, is the role of, of local parties, the shift that you spoke about. Um, and I think one of the members of the audience also raised the issue of, you know, it's, it's not as rosy as we sometimes make it out to be. Local parties are sometimes also playing a quite problematic role as uh, kingpins and coalitions or, or entities that quickly disappear after the elections. Um, so maybe that's something you, you, could, you could comment in addition to any other comment you want to make, but I'm going to ask you to keep it fairly brief as we are heading towards the end of our session. Tina, over to you. Okay. Thanks, Yap. Um, um, just to also try to be brief, um, I, I absolutely agree with some of the points that were mentioned by the previous speakers on the three questions about issues around political parties. Yes, um, um, local government doesn't have political parties, uh, political party funding, sorry, um, particularly when it comes to, to ward candidates. Um, you find that, um, especially when it comes to independent ward candidates, you find that some ward candidates um, who are running as independents, they have to rely more on what I referred to as the, you know, the patron-client relations that they have with community members. And um, you've got to remember that these relations also come with the expectations of being um, rewarded with either, you know, a job um, in, in part of the municipality as, as, um, as workers, or even the expanded works public works program. I found that even in my research, the expanded works public program um, is actually one of the key um, elements of negotiations with communities for getting support for winning an election um, with party candidates who are running as wards. Um, but with independent candidates, there are also other issues that come to play when it comes to the issue of 
um, vying for political authority and the popul popularity that an individual gets within that particular ward. And that popularity also comes with the fact that um, if an individual should be should be um, elected, there are also some um, expectations that do come with that in terms of their own loyalty. So when it comes to uh, funding, you know, that there are key elements that are attached to it. Of course, not to forget the fact that, um, you know, local government does not provide these adequate resources um, that are needed for political parties to, uh, to campaign. But again, um, just, just to, to, to also um, pick up on the issue of um, qualifications that your Johan um, spoke about. Yes, indeed, um, you know, political party members um, who are running for political office, they don't necessarily have to have professional qualifications. Um, and um, one of the key elements around that which one raises is issues tied to the way in which um, certain members are then elected to serve um, in committees, for example, the Section 80 committees that have, you know, delegated powers um, and authority from EXCO and the Section 79 committees, which are key um, scrutiny and oversight um, committees. You know, if you are going to have an individual who's appointed to be a chairperson um, of the MPAC, to be a chairperson um, of the Finance Committee, um, you've, you, 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 there is an expectation that is raised um, that that individual would obviously have some background understanding and knowledge about the complexities relating to, to the administrative um, information that is given um, to councillors. And one of the things that we keep on finding in our research is that councillors who, who don't have those basics, basic skills and understanding of the relational work that they have to do in these committees are often um, found in, in a position where information is concealed by the administration, um, they, they are unable to process or understand some of the documents that are given to them by, by the administration, and only to find that maladministration happens um, in the course of, of the process of, of providing oversight. So that is a debate. I'm, I'm offering it as a debate that we continuously need to have because one of the critical um, issues that I found in the research in a recent paper that I wrote um, about mayoral governance and leadership was that I found various factors contributing um, to, to mayoral candidates who were in, elected in 26. These issues were around issues of qualifications. One, one mayor was a 28 year old who was elected as the first mayor who had a master's degree and also political active background. The other mayor was um, a former bureaucrat who moved into, po moved into politics and became a mayor, but also had bureaucratic ex you know, experience. Um, issues of gender representation come in youth, um, you know, um, even um, when it comes to the popularity and not to discount the fact that factions will always be there when it comes to uh, positioning of, of individuals. So there are these various factors that we need to, to take into consideration, but when it comes to around issues of governance, when it comes to Section 80 and, and Section 79 committees, chairpersons, that's another debate that we, we, we need to um, hold um, and see how we can, we can um, and navigate around that. And then um, on, on um, the, the issue of the dynamics um, that we have seen where there are political shifts that are starting to emerge um, in local government, uh, especially when it comes to, to the, the non-holding of majority in council and the renegotiation of political parties trying to, to get um, the majority in council where you find um, the DA now being thrown out of council when it comes to um, their representation as the mayor and the exco, uh, the mayoral committee members, and the EFF reforming alliances again with the with the ANC. You can see that when it comes to when it comes to council governance, you know these these dynamics are starting to play out. And they actually contribute towards the pre precariousness or politics of precarity when it comes to um, um, the administration of um, the municipality and also the governance stability, 
of these structures when it comes to these municipalities because it's, there's a whole lot of politicking that is happening behind the scenes and there's a whole lot of renegotiation that is happening behind the scenes, alliances that are formed and reformed um, during this process. So then you, you have to bear in mind that although it, it, it throws in another form of, of democracy in the sense that there's no absolute power where political party, uh, the ruling political, the ruling political party, which is the ANC used to enjoy the dominant um, majority in council. Now they have to start playing the opposition politics as well. So, you know, we have to start thinking about the way in which this really affects, um, you know, um, governance and stability in municipalities and how the precarious of, 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 of the council politics also contribute towards the, the administration. And one thing that we, we are really watching very closely is the 2021 elections in terms of how much further are we going to see um, these hung councils emerging in other municipalities because in the previous elections it was only 27 municipalities that had hung councils. So there's a pro probability of having more councils um, coming up um, as hung councils and what kind of implications does this have? And we actually need more studies that really looks into coalition um, governments and which will tell us more about the way in which um, coalition gov governments I propel what we what we are what we are interested in seeing when it comes to governance and stability in municipalities and how it affects the administration and the delivery of services. So yeah. Thank you so much, Tina. Uh, again, uh, great input from your side. Wonderful. Thank you so much for for your inputs. Um, this is pretty much what we have time for today. Um, but I think what's very clear is that we have a very important year ahead. Uh, context of economic decline, dwindling resources, um, heightened political contestation, changing dynamics at local government level, pressures on the administration, uh, perhaps a lack of professionalism in some corners in local government. So the system is going to be under pressure and we're going to, first of all, look at the IEC for managing elections and, and, and leading us through this, this, this process. So good luck to uh, Sai and his, his team uh, at IEC to, to, um, uh, to, to prepare for these elections and hopefully we can call on, uh, on you again or, or one of your colleagues to, um, to help us uh, talk through some of these points. Uh, thanks to Johan also for sharing his inputs. Thanks to Tina. Uh, all three panelists were, were amazing. Uh, I think a very rich discussion. Um, I also want to say a special thanks to Courtney Sampson. I know he's in the audience uh, and the provincial electoral officer in the Western Cape, who actually, together with Khalil Mulaji of Salga, um, spoke about the need to have these kinds of dialogues in the run-up to the elections and uh, as the Dalla Omar Institute we took up that challenge and uh, and organized this dialogue and hopefully it will not be the last one uh, that that we will uh, that we'll have on the upcoming elections I think it's important to keep the conversation going and uh, to talk about the interface of of uh, electoral management, bureaucracies, politics, and service delivery, all these things are, are, are linked in, in so many different ways and we need to connect connect those dots, connect those people and, and get them to talk to each other. Um, uh, it was great to have the audience here. I hope I've done justice to the inputs that you shared with us on the chat box and the email. Uh, thank you very much for, 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 for passing those on. Uh, thanks to Selga, thanks IST, and thanks to the Hans Seidel Foundation for uh, sponsoring all of this. Um, and um, I've got nothing else to say, but um, good afternoon. Have uh, a wonderful Friday and weekend, and thank you uh, very much for, uh, for being with us this morning. Thanks, Sai. Thanks, Johan, and thanks, Tina. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, goodbye.